The thoughts of Korean War veterans. Paul Carroll is an expert on nuclear weapons. He joins me live from San Francisco. Paul, it was phenomenal watching this uh, event unfolding, also spending time with these vets, some of them pushing 90 years old. They weren't sure they would live to see this day. How about you? Uh, did you ever imagine you'd be watching something this historic, uh, this remarkable unfolding? Well, thanks, Mike, for having me. It, it is pretty momentous, I have to say. I, I, I must say I did think that this would be possible, but we have to be very cautious in our optimism. I, I've been to North Korea twice, and as I was listening to some of the reports and the joint communique coming from North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un and, and South Korea President Moon, you know, I've been in the War Museum in Pyongyang, and they do still live in a mindset that they are at war, not just with South Korea, but with the United States. The propaganda, the misleading imagery, the USS Pueblo that was captured in the 60s is still in their harbor in Pyongyang. So it's one thing to make these statements. It's another to begin to unwind the psychological, the national psyche of being in a state of war. It, well, let me ask you about the declaration. Uh, a lot of analysts will be poring over this, over the language. If for precisely uh, the points you're making here, what are the major takeaways when you look at it? Well, I saw what I see as the beginning of a process, the beginning of an architecture, and that's a good thing. The, the specificity on what each side would stop doing, uh, for example, no more audio blasts over the DMZ, no more leaflet uh, you know, across the line, those are low-hanging fruit. Those are annoyances that the North and South have sort of nudged each other with over the years. So it's really no skin off either of their nose, but it, it, it can be something readily done. What's more important to focus on, I think, is the fact that they will be continually in touch. There's a new hotline established, as you said earlier. There's going to be a fall meeting, a second summit in Pyongyang. These are things that we need to keep a close eye on. And we also have to have some tolerance for either mistakes or small violations. You know, the North is likely to do something that we may say, oh my gosh, you're not, you're not in the spirit of the deal. Well, we need to have tolerance for a speeding ticket, not for a murder or a burglary, but a speeding ticket we need to be able to live with and get back to the table. Paul, I've talked to a lot of people like yourself who are, who are very well versed in this subject. And, and over and over and over again over the last few years, I've heard them say, look, you, you simply can't trust the DPRK. We've gone down this road several times before. Um, it, it's going to end in heartbreak. What's different this time around? Not a lot is different, but what I would say is that we don't trust adversaries. So this, I think it's a, a misleading statement to say you can't trust the North Koreans. Of course you can't trust them. That's why you enter into discussions and negotiations to set up an arrangement of inspections, of monitoring, of declarations, so that you, you don't need to trust them. You need to have evidence that they're living up to their agreements. They have lived by missile moratorium in the past. They ended, yes, but for years in the late 90s and early 2000s, they imposed a missile moratorium on themselves and they lived by it until there were other developments where they, they stopped and we knew that they stopped. So I'm not saying all is good and we're going to see peace in our time, but what I am saying is this is the first card in a long poker game and we need to stay at the table. Paul, we, we just only have about 20 seconds. What do you expect from the Trump-Kim meeting? That's the next big step. I think what's important to watch is the Trump moon meeting that we heard about today. They'll meet together, our South Korean colleagues and, and allies and Trump. What I hope to see is that Secretary of Defense Mattis and uh, Secretary of State now Pompeo will be involved in setting the stage and keeping the parameters on point, not having it be, you know, having President Trump wing it and, and tweet the meeting. It's got to be thoughtful and intentional. Paul Carroll joining us from San Francisco. Thanks so much. Thank you.